Today we're in part two of a sermon series um, called Rotten, and uh, while that may not be the most appetizing title, uh, there's a reason that we called it that, we said that last week, and the reason is that within this series, we're encountering this running theme over and over um, throughout all of Mark 7 and 8, and it's this phrase that we introduced to you last week, guess what, still true in week two, and here's the phrase, you may want to write it down, it is that the core of the problem is the core of who we are. That's the phrase. The core of the problem is the core of who we are. In these passages in Scripture, there was a reality 2,000 years ago. Now, fast forward to today. Guess what? Still truth. Like, still truth that in many of the broken situations, circumstances, things that we walk through in life, the core of the problem actually is us. Right? It's the core of who we are, and for some of us, that's a little harder to say than others. Now, as we're admitting that and owning that and being honest with that, because that's what Scripture is saying to us, here's what we also gather under, and so don't forget this. We said it last week. We're going to say it at the beginning today, and then I'm going to come back around it at the end, is that even though, yeah, we got issues, right? You don't look at your neighbor and say that, but like you know that they do, right? And they know you do, and you know they do. Um, but here's the good news, that we have a God of grace, right, who covers all of that. And that's why we sing. That's why we worship. That's why we celebrate. But we're also the kind of people that go, well, hey, maybe we should probably be honest about actually who we are in the midst of that. And so that's really what this series is about. If you like that, awesome. If you don't, uh, we'll catch you at lunch, okay? Uh, Mark 7 and 8 is where we're going. So if you got a copy of Scripture, go to Mark 7 today. Mark 7, if you have a copy of Scripture, hard copy, digital copy, love for you to keep it open. Take some notes so that you remember all of the uh, great wisdom that will be shared with you today uh, from the Holy Spirit, not from me. Uh, Mark 7, we're going to pick actually right back up where we left off last week. As you're turning there, um, last week we started in chapter 7, verse 1, and there was a conversation happening between Jesus and the Pharisees and some of the religious leaders. You remember that? And the Pharisees walked into this moment with wrong perspective, wrong motive, um, because they were there to judge the actions of Jesus, okay? This is not the sermon today, but just a little side street. Don't walk into a situation judging Jesus, okay? All right, you're not Judge Judy, and don't judge Jesus. Neither one of those, all right? Um, and so they were there to judge Jesus. That didn't go well because Jesus is the great teacher, and he flipped the script. You remember that last week? And he spoke very directly to them. He had some pointed things to say. Um, and last week, we talked about how Jesus in that moment was showing us through Scripture, through his conversation with the Pharisees, some things that Jesus hates. And we identified those last week. Now, we did not say that Jesus hates people, because I don't think he hates people. But there are some things at the broken core of who we are that Jesus stands in opposition to. His word proves it. And last week, we talked about how Jesus hates it when we pretend, when we give lip service, but our life doesn't back it up. Um, Jesus hates it, he said last week, when we let go of God's commands. And Jesus hates it. Here's where we landed last week. Jesus hates it when legalism overshadows love. And last week, Jesus exposed the core of the Pharisees, and they were filled with pride and legalism. And he spoke very directly into that. They were all about keeping man-made rules to look good on the outside, but the problem was inside they were living a lie. And so today I tell you that because what's going to happen today is Jesus is going to pick up with the very next verse in this conversation. You can kind of picture the moment, right? Like Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. I don't know if they're sitting or standing, but the Pharisees are here. Jesus is teaching. He used the hypocrite word. Maybe that created a crowd. There's a crowd that also gathers around. And so today Jesus kind of takes his attention from just the Pharisees and he turns and begins speaking to the crowd. But I think in many ways probably still within earshot of the Pharisees because there were still some things they needed to hear. And this is where we pick up. Mark chapter 7, verse 14. It says, again, Jesus called the crowd to him, and he said, listen to me. Everyone and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Now, quick footnote. If your Bible is like mine, it doesn't have any words after them, it may just have like a parenthesis or something around the number 16, but there's no words for verse 16. Let me talk about that for a second. Um, many commentators believe that this verse was added later. Therefore, there's a lot of our translations that it doesn't actually include the text of that verse. However, there are a lot of people who are way smarter than me 
who went, we believe what Jesus said in verse 16, actually was very similar to what he said in Mark 4.23, and I looked that up for you. Here's what Jesus said in Mark 4.23, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. So what did Jesus say in verse 16? <laughs> Listen up. All right, that's what he said. All right. Now, where was Jesus going with what he was addressing? Well, if you remember last week's passage, you remember the beef that the Pharisees had with Jesus' disciples is that they were eating food with what? Hands that were ceremonially unclean. And the Pharisees were not okay with that. And so Jesus is just building on that conversation by turning to the crowd and addressing the root of the problem. The Pharisees, watch this, this is everywhere we're headed today. The Pharisees are worried that sin will come into them from the outside but Jesus makes the point that we already have sin on the inside. Okay, That's what he said just a second ago. He said, nothing outside a person can defile them by going in, but it's what comes out of a person that defiles them, and what comes out of them had to start where? In them. Okay. So let's also realize this. Jesus is not saying that there are not some defiling things that we can put into ourselves, i.e. certain substances, pornography, you fill in the list of things that we can put into us that today the Holy Spirit would go, no, not good for the inside of you. But what Jesus is saying in this specific context is he's addressing ceremonial cleanliness concerning food. That's what he's talking about. After Jesus speaks to the crowd, Scripture tells us that he steps into a home. He gets in a little more intimate, smaller group with his disciples. And the disciples, kind of like maybe you and me after we read those verses, they went, Jesus, hold on. We didn't fully get that outside. We didn't fully understand. Could you clarify this thing that you said? And Jesus does that for them. So that's where we pick up verse 17, Mark 7. After he, after Jesus had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable, about his teaching. Jesus answered, are you so dull? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? Verse 19, for it doesn't go into their heart, but what they put into them goes into their stomach and then out of the body. And in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Now, there's a whole lot happening in three verses there. I'm going to give you a quick highlight of all those, and then we're going to zoom in on number three. Um, the first thing that Jesus did there, if you caught it, is that Jesus gave his disciples a biology lesson about the human body's digestive system. <laughs> did you catch that? All right. It's in the Bible, right? Not just your biology teacher. Jesus came up with it first. He says anything that goes in here has to come... Has come out somewhere, okay? All right, and there's many things that I could insert right there. I decided that's the end of that point. All right, that's all I'm going to say about that. So he gives them that lesson. Then second, what did he say in verse 19? It says that Jesus declared all foods are clean. Now understand context of the moment. Under the Mosaic law of the time, there were certain dietary restrictions. There were many foods that were off limits. You don't go there. You can't eat that. But in this moment, Jesus is showing New Testament, greater law coming. He was overshadowing the Mosaic law, thus making all foods clean. And you go, awesome. What does that mean for me? Well, boys, if you like a good steak, all right, or a solid all-you-can-eat buffet, that was a big moment for us, all right? We're in on that one. Verse 19, you write that one down. But greater than the biology lesson or the fact that he now called your steak clean, Jesus was making a spiritual point. He was giving a reminder to the disciples and to you and me today. And so that's what we're going to kind of pull out of the text is three different um, powerful, important reminders for you and for me. And here's the first one, that misguided focus misses the point. Misguided focus misses the point. You write it down, I'll help it make sense in a moment. The Pharisees in this moment, the Pharisees, the disciples, and the crowd that were all gathered around Jesus were all focused on what? The food. They were so concerned about the food. You know what Jesus was not concerned about? The food. Jesus wasn't speaking medically or physiologically, but he was making a spiritual point. Now, the Jews who ate unclean food became unclean 
not because of the food that made them unclean, but because when they did that, they disobeyed God's word. That's what made them unclean. Now, quick question for today. Um, how many of you uh, would proudly raise your hand and say, like, at your house, um, you take off your shoes before you come inside? We got anybody, like, you take off shoes before you come inside? Okay, we got, like, one or two, and the rest of them are like, I don't, I don't know. Am I going to be weird if I raise my hand? Okay, all right, listen. All good. Like, I'm, I'm all about some cleanliness. Like, let's go with that, okay? We don't do the whole shoes off at the door at my house, but some people do, and it's all good. Don't you like that? Like, when you walk to that house, you've been to that house before, and you're like, oh, shoot, what socks did I wear today, <laughs> right? Did I wear socks today? Did I cut my toenails last night, all right? All right, that's too much. Um, <laughs> in some countries, it's customary. Like, that's just what you do, right? You've probably read that before in, like, geography class. Like, that's, that's what you do. Take off your shoes. Think about this with me. Nothing wrong with that. But in doing so, the attempt is to take the dirt and the filth from the outside, correct, and to keep it from coming inside. Think with me. But the truth is, you can have people take off their shoes at the door to keep the filth out of your home and still have your home be filled with filth. Like filthy words or dirty feelings or unsanitary relationships if you will. So the greater question I believe we have to ask is, is the greater dirt coming from the outside in or is it already on the inside? And that's what Jesus is trying to help the Pharisees wake up to realize, that the core of the problem is the core of who you are. And the Pharisees and ultimately the disciples were living with a misguided focus, which in many ways was causing them to miss the whole point. That's why Jesus in his questioning right there in verse 17 and 19, he got a little, a little frustrated with him. Do you feel that a little bit? He's like, come on, guys. And I believe, church, that the same thing can happen to us today, that when our, our focus is wrong, we can miss the whole point and sometimes you and I can get so focused on something that's not even the point of what God is doing or trying to show us. Let me put some flesh on that. Like sometimes it's possible to get really focused on if I could get that role in the company or that job or work at that new place, just get out of this role that I'm in. And we can get so focused on that and, comp watch this, and completely miss the fact that maybe God's leaving us where he is to shape us and mold us for something that's coming down the road that we can't even see the big picture for. Right? And a misguided focus can cause us to miss the whole point. Or when, how about this one, when the relationship ends and then you do everything you can to fight and claw and text and spam and all that to get it back that's where your belonging is or that's where your identity is and what you could miss the whole time is that maybe God's trying to remove you from something to protect you from something you didn't even realize was a problem in the first place and you fill in the blank with maybe your situation but what I'm saying is that it's so possible to live with a misguided focus and miss what God's teaching us underneath here the whole time because when we walk in our focus, we go with what we know, what we want, what we desire, and we can miss the sovereign plan of God that he's trying to teach us and walk us in the whole time. So how do you protect yourself from that? Now, I want to live with a misguided focus. Well, how, how do you protect yourself from that? Well, the running theme today with this point and the rest of our time is that when we are people of the word, who live daily attentive to the Spirit, right? If you're in Christ, Holy Spirit of God in you, what does it do? It helps us keep our eyes off of what we see, and it helps us begin to see things in some ways that God sees them. The Pharisees and the disciples were doing what? They were missing the point. It wasn't about the food. <laughs> Jesus like, stop looking at the food. Stop thinking about the law of the food. Like, let's talk about your heart, because that's the focus of all that I'm saying to you. So see, a misguided focus can cause us to miss the point. Pick up verse 20. Go back to Mark 7. And Jesus goes on. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And then he gives us this list of sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and greed and malice and deceit and lewdness and envy and slander and arrogance and folly. Verse 23, all these evils come from inside and defile a person. So 
So Jesus is just continuing his explanation to the disciples, and he's saying what? He's saying it's what goes in, or excuse me, it's not what goes in, but it's what comes out. It's Jesus' words. What comes out of a person that defiles them, or essentially what Jesus is trying to help them teach in this moment, understand in this moment, is that things cannot be, ceremonially, religiously speaking, things cannot be clean or unclean, but only people can ultimately be defiled. And then he said how they're defiled. How are they defiled? Their actions, which are ultimately a product of their what? Of their heart. And that's the second and maybe most important reminder today that sin starts in the heart. Okay? Don't miss that. Write that down. Sin always starts in the heart. Now, these Old Testament food laws that maybe we don't fully understand, but ultimately they were pictures for Israel to teach them about the holiness of God. But here's what Jesus is showing them. He's showing them here that those food laws have been finished. I've overshadowed them, and God is no longer worried about what comes into our stomachs, but what he is most concerned about is what comes out of our hearts. That sin always starts in the heart. Um, one commentator that I read this week told the story of this massive tree um, that started as a little seed, grew into a massive tree, large branches, huge trunk, and one night a storm came through, maybe very similar to what we experienced this week, and the storm blew this massive tree in the middle of a park all the way down, across the walkway. It stood there for years. As people came and they found the damage that had been done, all that was left coming out of the ground, like maybe we saw in pictures this week, was just a stump. It was just the core of the stump, the whole tree laying on the ground. And as they began to look into the stump and examine things, they found thousands and thousands of these tiny insects that were at the heart of the stump eating at the core of the tree. Don't miss it. Ultimately, the weakness of this massive tree did not come because of the storm, but the weakness of that tree started the very moment that the first insect entered its core and began eating away at it. And church, in the same way, the moment that we give way, the moment that we excuse it, the moment that we open the door to the one thing that begins to come in and eat away is the moment where things really begin to fall apart. Sin always starts in the heart. And I think that's why Solomon, way more wiser than all of us, in his wisdom, he wrote these words, write it down. Proverbs 4.23, Solomon says, Above all else, at the top of your to-do list, make it your highest priority to guard your heart. Guard your heart. Why? Because everything you do flows from it. Right? Like you don't have to go to anatomy class very long to realize like the heart is the hub of who we are, physically and spiritually, right? Like physically speaking, no heartbeat, no life. Spiritually, your heart is at the core of your soul, of your connectivity with God, of your connection with him. And if your heart, spiritually speaking, is unhealthy, right, it leads to great destruction in our life because sin starts in the heart. I read this quote this week. It says, every outward act of sin is preceded by an inward act of choice. You can say, uh-oh or ouch, either one. Every outward act of sin is preceded by an inward act of choice. And we have to say, right on. Because in verses 21 and 22 that we just read from Mark 7, Jesus did what? He gave a 13-part list of all of the kind of evil that can come from where? From the human heart. It's not an exhaustive list of like all sins, but he put a whole bunch of them down there. And here's what I want us to do for just a moment. We're just going to spend just a moment on each one of them. It may not be super comfortable, but I believe it's part of the word. And here, here's my hope in doing this, that there may be one or two that may just, just resonate with you, and maybe God grabs you on, or he, or he speaks to you through, and it would just remind you today of this great point that we sit underneath, that sin, it always starts in the heart, that it's, it's the core of who I am. So let's just begin to walk through that list. Okay, Jesus' first list, what? Evil thoughts. That's what he says in the NIV. 
our thoughts, think about it, our thoughts start as desires, correct, deep from inside of us, from the heart of who we are. The thought comes from inside of you. And while sometimes, yes, we have happy, merry thoughts, sometimes we don't. And sometimes they are evil and hurtful and negative, and it starts at the heart of who we are. Next Jesus list, sexual immorality. Think about this. Every kind, every kind of extramarital, unlawful, or unnatural sexual act began as a thought or a passion in the heart. Every one of them. Sin starts at the heart. Number three, theft. Theft is next. Now listen, this doesn't just mean the robberies that you see on the news. No, theft in this moment means any act of taking from others unjustly, including unfair wages or incurring of debts with never the hope of being able to pay it off or any other form of dishonesty where we, we take from people or it's towards others, it all starts in the heart. Murder. Every man or woman who's ever been locked up for taking someone's life first had what? An unhealthy heart idea that led to what? A life-changing action. Starts in the heart. Number five, Jesus lists adultery, which also starts where? In the heart. And Jesus says it can actually be committed in the heart. Reading Jesus' words, Matthew 5, verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman, or we could say a man lustfully, has already committed adultery with him or her in his heart. In his heart. Every broken home created by adultery began in a heart. Verse 22 lists greed. <laughs> we live in America, <laughs> right? We're in the land of more and bigger and better and nicer. We can walk in greed and never even realize it. Malice, number seven. Malice is the intent or desire to do evil. That's what malice is. Now, let me give you what James says about malice. James chapter four. This is so good. This may be the whole reason you came for the message today because you want to know why you're fighting with your spouse, with your kids, with your teacher, why you can't get along with your boss. You ready? No, you're not. Here we go. James four, verse one. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle where? Within your spouse. Within your kids. Nope, it's not what it says. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill, so you argue, so you holler, so you walk in bitterness, so you don't forgive. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Malice, the intent to do, desire, evil. It's in me. It's in the heart of who I am. Number eight, Jesus lists deceit. Deceit. Every lie and untruth originates from a heart desire to cover up or mislead. Hear that, kids, teenagers? That's a message we're preaching at my house. Like, we walk in honesty. We do not walk in deceit. As people of the Spirit, there are no hidden things. And when I hide, right, where does it come from? It's me. It's the heart of me. Number nine, lewdness is the word the NIV uses, lewdness or sensuality. Here's what it means. It's a lack of moral restraint. That's what lewdness is, a lack of moral restraint. Perhaps the most um, clear example or one of the examples of this is that some of you can remember, right? Um, some of you have been on this planet long enough that you can remember when a TV show was, was filtered or, or pushed out because it had one cuss word in it. Anybody just like, you can nod. You don't have to admit how old you are, right? But you just remember that, okay? Now I just turn it on, right? And anything goes. Why? Okay. A growing lack of moral restraint. Right? Where did it come from? The heart of man. Sin always starts at the heart. Envy, number 10. If you've ever had a moment, right, of looking down on the success or the possessions of a coworker or sibling or friend on social media, because they had and you didn't, or they got and you did Listen to me, your heart birthed envy. 
came from the heart of who you are. Three more. Slander. Slander is basically summed up as speech that seeks to wound someone else. And I know we've never done that, <laughs> but the world has. Speech that seeks to wound someone else. And it actually could go one of two ways. It can be against man or it can be towards God. But guess what? Both of them, I'll start right here. Slander comes from the heart. Next, arrogance or pride. Wow, perhaps the greatest struggle of all of humanity. And if you've ever been to Walmart right, and seen someone else's kids acting a fool and you inwardly thought, I would never parent my kids that way, <laughs> guilty as charged with pride. Because I've seen your kids. <laughs> <laughs> Number 13, finally, folly or foolishness, which means this, church, a lack of prudence or good judgment. That's what folly is, a lack of prudence or good judgment. And if you've ever been a teenager, <laughs> you are guilty <laughs> of doing something foolish. And Jesus lists all of these 13 things, and do you know the very next words out of his mouth? All these evils come from inside a person. That sin always starts in the heart. The great pastor J.C. Ryle once said this, We have within us the beginning of every sin under heaven. Think about that. You have the capacity in you. I have the desire, sinfulness in me. We can have within us the beginning of every sin under heaven. Sin always starts in the heart. So as you hear that heartwarming, encouraging truth today, right? No, but seriously, as you hear that, right? And maybe it, maybe it humbles you, maybe it's difficult to hear, maybe it's hard to wrestle with. What, the question, what do you do with that? Like, what do we do with that? that? That it's all of us, guilty as charged. I mean, maybe like you're 13 for 13 on the list. What do, you, what do you do with that truth that sin starts at the heart? Well, I've got two responses there for everyone today. Two responses from God's word that our response to sin is at the core of who I am. You ready? Here's the first one acknowledge it. Just own it. Acknowledge it. Like daily, we have to remind ourselves that the core of the problem is the core of me. I think that's part of the beauty, right, of starting in God's word or in prayer, like from about the time your feet hit the ground or you're at the breakfast table, because when we hold ourselves up next to the holiness of God, through his word, in prayer, through songs of worship, guess what you realize? I'm the problem, it's me. That becomes your new theme song. Hey, it's me. So you acknowledge it. Um, Pastor D.L. Moody once said this. I'm just going to read this bit to you. He says, um, if a man should advertise that he could take a correct photograph of people's hearts, do you believe he would find any customers? There is not a man among us that you could hire to have his photograph taken if you could photograph the real man, the inner man. Now think about it. We go to have our pictures taken, and we carefully arrange our makeup and our hair, and if the photographer flatters us, we say, oh yes, that's a first-rate picture. That's a first-rate likeness. And right, we pass it around among our friends. We post it in hopes of getting all the likes. But let the real man be brought out, the photograph of the heart, and see if we will pass that around among our neighbors. We would not want our own spouses to see it. We might even be frightened to look at it ourselves. See, church, when we, when we battle with envy or greed or slander or arrogance or misguided sexual desires or you fill in the blank, listen to me. We have to acknowledge starts with us. Listen, it's not them. It's not he did, she did, they made me, they pushed me, they caused me, they did, and so I. Nope. The core of the problem is me. And Jesus today in his words is just saying, 
I'm just asking you to acknowledge it. Just asking you to raise your hand. And go, no, I, I want, James 4, I want, but I do not get. Feelings, emotions, possessions, whatever. So I quarrel and fight. And Jeremiah 17, verse 9, makes it so clear. The prophet says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Yes. Yes. So the first response to the truth that sin starts in the heart is to do what? Just acknowledge it. We just own it. It's me. May I examine myself before I examine you. The second response, you ready? The second response is you ask God to redeem us. Ask God to redeem you. Church, we are sinful at our core. The word says it. We're acknowledging it today. And the truth is, here's the hard part. We're incapable of fixing it on our own. There's not enough self-help books or great memes on Facebook like to fix the core of who we are. Like we can't do it. But here's the good news. Jesus doesn't call us to behavior modification, but he calls us to gospel transformation. That he would do the work in us. And there's the reminder. There's the good news. Final reminder. Write this one down. Hope is coming your way. Jesus redeems us inside out. Jesus redeems us inside out. One of the greatest wrong beliefs of our culture, our little section of the world, regarding Christianity and faith is this thought, and chances are you've had it. If I just say yes to Jesus, if I just have an emotional church religious experience, if I call myself a Christian, and maybe even the thought is, and I'll get baptized, okay, then many of my problems will go away and I will begin to act and behave differently. And I am just telling us today, church, that that belief is massively off base. Let me illustrate it this way. Imagine that you have a habit of stealing things. Imagine you have a habit of stealing things. You decide you want to be a Christian, so to do so, you decide, I'm going to stop stealing things. Now, what did you do? You stopped the outward behavior, but the truth is, inwardly, you still want to steal things. And when people aren't watching, or people won't know or find out, you still steal things. And everyone believes that you're different, that there's been a change. But the truth is, inwardly, you are still just as rotten and unrighteous as you ever were. Why? Because you can't fix a heart condition with an attempt to simply change your actions. Listen, Jesus' greatest desire isn't to change your behavior, but it's to change your heart. It's not to change your behavior, but his desire is to change your heart. You and I, in our own power, we are incapable of changing our own hearts. We've shown that over and over and over. We can try all we want to be as good as we want, but we will still be just as sinful and as unrighteous as we ever have been until, until we allow Jesus to do the changing work from the inside out. That is gospel transformation, that I receive him, that I put my faith in him, that I surrender to him all of myself, and then he in his spirit begins this work in me, this redeeming work in me as I'm in the word, as I'm praying to him, as I'm walking in the spirit, as I'm worshiping, as I'm serving, as I'm growing with others, he begins taking this heart that was broken <clears throat> that has evil desires, that longs to do things that are outside of God's design, and he shapes it and he molds it over time in his way, in his sovereignty, into a place where what is inside does change what's coming out. But it starts with a redeeming work from the inside out. And one of the most beautiful verses from the Old Testament is the picture that God gives through Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Here's what God says to his people, and here's what he says to you today. He says, I will give you a new heart. 
and, and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, your heart of evil that desires to walk outside of my designs, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you, and I will then move you, then move you. See that? I'll put my spirit in you, spirit alive in you, and then I'll move you to follow my decrees, that your behavior might look different, that your actions would want to look different. And that you would be careful to keep my laws and my commands. Jesus first starts, though, from the inside out. When you try to start outside in, all you result is headaches, frustrations. I tried, but it didn't work. I wanted to, but I can't. And the answer is, you're right, you can't. But when he puts in you a new heart and his spirit alive in you and you walk in the spirit, then he begins to redeem us from the inside out. And so I would say today in, in such a practical way, listen, if you're battling and there's, there's a sin or there's a struggle in your life, maybe it's something that only you know. Maybe it's something that a lot of people know. And you're going, man, I know this is not God's will for me. This is not what he wants me to walk in. But man, this is a war. Man, this is a fight. Listen to me. What if your mindset changed from... Man, I know I, I just need to stop doing this. Like, I've got to really quit this. I've got to put that down. I've got to know more of that. And what if your mindset changed from that thought to a prayer to God to say, God, will, will you change my heart? Will you, will you begin, as only your spirit can, will you begin to change my desires from the inside? From the inside out, God, God, in light of this addiction, would you change what I desire? God, God, in light of my sexual purity and the struggle that I'm in, would you change me from the inside out? Because if you change what's inside of me through your spirit in me, I won't even get in that situation anymore. God, when it comes to my fear and my anxiety and my, my doubt where I don't want to walk with you in faith, would you start working in here? And you may not change the situation or the circumstance out there, but I believe you can redeem me from the inside out. And God, in, in light of my bitterness and my unforgiveness and how I feel about him, how I feel about her, how I feel about them, listen, before you change them, God, would you redeem me from the inside out? Jesus redeems us from the inside out. Why? Because sin starts in the rotten heart of man. And that's you and me. And the core of the problem is the core of who we are. But at the same place we started today is the same place that we end today. The beautiful reminder that we worship and we serve and we receive a new heart from a God of all grace and all love. John says if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge it, if we let him redeem us, if we confess our sins, he, that God, doesn't meet us with condemnation and shame and judgment, but John says he's faithful. He's faithful, and he's just. To do what? To cleanse us of all unrighteousness, to make us new in him, and to give us a new heart. Thanks for joining us online today. As we gather, we sing songs of worship. We center ourselves on the truth of God's word. We encourage one another through community, and we do it all so that we might be changed to live more like Jesus. Through our time today, we pray God showed you what it means for you to follow Jesus with your life and to live as the church in the world. We are available and ready to pray for and encourage you as you discover and grow in your faith. To speak with one of our ministry team members or to have someone pray for you, you can text your first name to 601-397-6111 or message us through any one of our social media channels. Our ministry team would love to pray for you and help you in any way. You can also find reading plans and other resources to help you take next steps in your faith on our website, www.theexchange.cc. Now, as we close out our time today and prepare to scatter as the church, let's speak out our declaration together. We believe the great exchange took place when Jesus who had no sin became sin for us so we can know God. 
We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving, we will serve others. Pleasing for reaching, we will share our faith. Keeping for dispersing, we will make disciples. Forgetting for celebrating, we will praise God. We are the church.